ladies and gentlemen, my name's Sophie Scott. I'm the medical reporter for ABC, and I'm gonna be your host for this uh, panel discussion. So, um, as with other sessions today, we want this to be interactive. So, we want you to be getting on the app and asking questions. I'll try to get through as many questions as I can in the session today. There'll also be the opportunity for you to ask questions from the floor as well. Uh, if you're on Twitter, hands up who's on Twitter and Instagram. Okay, excellent. So if you are on Twitter and Instagram, please tweet about this session, take photos. Um, the, the hashtag is ABF19. And if you can include the, um, the IPA handle, and my handle is Sophie Scott and the number two, if you could include that, and I'll try to retweet things as we go. And now we've been sitting for a little while, so while I introduce all our amazing panelists, I'd like everyone in the audience to stand up. Just, we know prolonged sitting's bad for you. And we can also, that means you can give our panel a standing ovation that they deserve. <laughs> so, this might be the highlight. I'll start off the end. We have Professor Ewan Wallace. He's the inaugural Chief Executive Officer of Safer Care Victoria. He's an academic obstetrician and gynaecologist by training. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> we have Professor Amanda Walker. She's the clinical director at the Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare and a specialist in palliative care. She teaches communication and development at the Western Sydney School of Medicine. Give her a round of applause. We have Dr. Craig Margetts. He's the director of medical services at Redcliffe Hospital, Metro North Hospital and Health Services. Give Craig a round of applause. We have Kathy Jones. So Kathy is the national quality manager for Health Scope with 25 years experience in public and private hospitals, and she hosts a very popular podcast called Do no, oh, no Harm Done, which I suggest you all subscribe to. Give Kathy a round of applause. <laughs> and last but not least, we have, uh, have we gone through everyone? Alastair, there we are, my first, my first panelist. He is a physician uh, from Tasmania, based in Launceston, working in private practice, and he's chair of the Clinical Advisory Committee to IPA. So give them all a big round of applause. Thank you. Now, you may be seated. Thank you. So, uh, we've heard a lot today about the theory of activity-based funding. We've heard a lot of theoretical discussion. What we're hoping from this session is we'll hear some more of the practical applications of how it actually works on the ground and the clinical applications when it comes to hospitals. So, let's start with the good news. So, when it comes to activity-based funding, let's talk about the benefits and where it's working well. So, let's start with the benefits. Craig, what do you see as the benefits for, for ABF? Yeah. Yeah. If I boom. <laughs> That's a <good>. nice loud <laughs> voice. Yes, yeah, so Craig. I started with uh, case mix and ABF in 1988, which is uh, technically impossible given that I'm only 35. <laughs> um, and looking at that trajectory, the main thing it's done, I think, of benefit is provided an ability to have a conversation. Mm. It's the conversations with... Um, uh, administrative staff and clinicians with funders and patient level working at the coal phase mm. um, that I think has been the main benefit um, over the years. And I've seen that really uh, make significant changes both in quality and in, mm. in, in financial value. And what about our other panellists? So, um, Alistair, what would you say about the benefits? Where have you seen it really Certainly. beneficial? In my practice and, uh, and in my role as a, running a department, uh, the, the improvement in data uh, has, has, been, you know, has, has really been on a very steep curve. And as a result of that, you know, suddenly I have clinicians who wouldn't have thought about in terms of activity, wouldn't have thought of in, in terms of, uh, of that sort of data, you know, coming to my office wanting to interrogate data, looking at, you know, looking at their rates of, uh, of various uh, things, including their rates of complications, etc. So there's been a real mindset change uh, amongst my clinicians you know, that I work with, uh, with respect to the utility of data in planning how they uh, how they perform their their tasks, uh, how they uh, how they look at their cohort of patients uh, in terms of you know, of, uh, of activity, and it's starting to drive you know, change as the hacks and the the quality and safety work gets done. It starts starting to drive change in that area as well, you know, because that data is now in front of them potentially uh, and uh, you know on the side there's also been some recognition of the time they spend teaching and uh, and training and you and any and amanda um i mean it, it's made us one of the most efficient health systems in the world and christine when 
in our um, talk on health reform, showed a couple of slides. Um, one from OECD comparing us, the sort of matchstick slides with matchsticks up and down um, below the average. And in terms of efficiency, we have one of the most efficient healthcare systems in the world, driven principally through um, ABF and case mix. And you know, you know, Victorians are the kings and queens of case mix. We'll get to the downsides <laughs> in a minute, but um, um, it, it has, start, it, you know, whether we like it or not, it's made us a very night. efficient system. It's good to start on a positive Yeah, note. absolutely. Yeah. Amanda? Um, so first disclaimer, I actually work in palliative care which is ANSNAP funded, so I'll just be an ill-informed clinician speaking loudly and opinionatedly. Um, but I, I've worked in the southwestern suburbs of Sydney with massive development and growth. And so we have a town the size of Dubbo or Shepparton in Victorian terms, um, growing every two years within our catchment. And so for us, it means that funding doesn't just stay in the sandstones and the royals, it actually goes to where the people are and moves with the population. Maybe slowly, but it does eventually get there. And for me, that's a really good thing. Cathy, your observations? Yeah, look, I think that uh, we've had pay for performance kind of incentives and penalties in the private sector for about a decade. So we're really very familiar with things like not being paid for sentinel events. That's been happening a lot longer in the private sector, actually, than in the public sector. Um, and no, I was never, as a quality professional, as a clinician, I was never really involved in health fund negotiations or, or funding discussions. But I think it's really improved the discussion to have people who actually understand the quality and safety of care involved in those funding discussions. And that is a new thing, as the rest of the panel was saying. Okay, so you've heard some of the benefits, and I'm sure there are many more that we could talk about. But let's also flip that around now and talk about the downsides. So uh, what are the downsides or drawbacks to having um, activity-based funding? Should we start up the other end, Ewan? What are the downsides? Well, um, you know, at, at, the, at the core of all this, of course, are human beings. So we have a set of coders in our hospitals whose job it is is to extract as much money out of our respective departments of health as possible. That's the way our system is built. Um, um, I have to say, you know, I mean, there's, there's literature from elsewhere in the world looking at, you know, highly regulated pay for activity systems and lesser regulated. I, I, I'm not suggesting that we, we're not compliant in Australia and I think the, the error rates for coding are actually extremely low. Mm -hmm. At least they are in Victoria, I can't speak for other jurisdictions. Error rates are extremely low. But uh, you know, at the core of this is human behaviour. Um, mm -hmm. And th there are perverse incentives in the system. So we're, we're fueling activity and we heard from Tanya, mm -hmm. you know, the the health links talk from our, from our own department here in Victoria. Trying to, the health links is trying to break away from um, from driving activity, particularly driving more complex activity, to better meet the needs of patients. Mm. And you know, she used the words in one of her slides: "What matters to you?" And we've lost the "what matters to you" mm. from um, activity-based funding. Um. Alistair, did you have some thoughts? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think one of the things we've noticed uh, is that there is a bit of misconception in our, particularly our medical fraternity, who, who uh, those who work in the procedural and the uh, and, and cross over between the fee for service and the uh, and the um, public sector, have this concept that activity-based funding is is effectively de facto a fee for service model, uh, and so uh, instead of recognising that they are uh, that they are defined by a service agreement you know, and how much service they're going to deliver over a period of time, uh, they take the approach that, uh, well, if, if, I'm being, uh, if I'm being funded based on my activity, the more I do, uh, the, more, uh, the, the more the funding occurs. So it's taken quite a, quite a deal of time to, to, to unwrap the, the back of house process and, and see the process rolling over over time intervals rather than you know, it being perceived as a sort of quasi fee for service process, which, uh, which some of my colleagues uh, certainly did uh, when we first started. And so you, you were saying to me earlier, Alistair, that you, you felt that some doctors were very disillusioned with that system initially. Yeah, yeah I, I, think, uh, I think there was a real sense initially that you know, this was not going to, you know, this, that this was something that uh, was foreign. We're a very change-reverse profession. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and in fact, any change that we didn't think of ourselves, you know, it, we're quite resistant <laughs> yeah. to. Um, and, and so in that context, you know, there was this, this sense. And, and particularly once the hack stuff, 
mm. started to uh, come on the horizon. There was a lot of pushback from uh, mm. from my from my clinicians, actually, and from some of my administrators about about this and about you know, given their perception of the quality of our data mm. uh, that we were probably going to be seriously uh, impeded by this sort of stuff. Yet. You know, when you actually examine it, the quality of our data is actually quite good, mm. and and the frequency with which you know, you're significantly penalised as a result of you know, these issues. I mean, for central events, it's a, you know, it, it really, you know, yes, I agree they shouldn't be funded, but at the end of the day, you know, we would hope to only have, you know, hopefully none. <coughs> but uh, it, so the implications for funding are actually very small for a big hospital, um, and and so there was this, there was a sense that we we're doing a lot of data, um, looking for a lot of data, reporting a lot of things and, you know, and without necessarily seeing a significant outcome from it, partially because you know, we're still, you know, uh, still effectively, you know, although the health department is funded through ABF, we're still largely funded through a fixed budget for a period mm. of time. And so, um, Craig, when we spoke, you were saying um, one of the downsides that you felt to AB ABF was that it doesn't reward doing nothing. Yes, yeah, one of the um, one of the historical for the older people in the room that are familiar with the House of God Law 13 says that the delivery of good quality health care is to do as much nothing as possible. <laughs> so, pursuant to that, we uh, identified a cohort of people who came in through the ED in medicine, stayed one night, and went the next day. And uh, because of bed pressures and mm -hmm. a range of other things, we said, wouldn't it be better if we actually got the physicians to go to the ED? Yeah make sure which patients did need to come in and so we very successfully got rid of seven, uh, about 700 wow which cost us three and a half million dollars thanks for that <laughs> um, so one of the challenges is you get what you count mm. and the system isn't quite good enough yet to pay you for what you didn't do even if it cost you more money to not do it mm. and Cathy from your mm. perspective what have you, what have you seen as the, as the downsides or the drawbacks to ABF so um, I'm going to just branch from directly just ABF, but sure. the hack funding in particular, uh, while I think it's fantastic and it's really terrific, we have to be really careful that we're not losing the purpose for why we measure complications. So we don't measure complications for funding. That, that is not why we do it. And I think that if, uh, and the clinicians can smell this a mile off, you know, we don't go to their clinicians and say, we need to reduce our complications or we don't get paid. That is not gonna motivate anybody. So you have to be really clear about your purpose. And I think if we start to lose that purpose, we all know why we measure complications and the better we measure them, the more we can reduce them. And that's, that's where my, concern is here about mm. the, that might creep in a bit. So I've noticed that no one has asked a question yet in the app, so <laughs> I want you to all get on the app, and not all, because we wouldn't have time for all of them, but if you be thinking about the questions, we've got some amazing panellists up here, and it's a really good opportunity for you to ask what you're interested in, and your questions, because there will be time in the last 20 minutes for the questions. Um, and Amanda, when we spoke, you, one of the things you said to me was that um, people don't feel it's their responsibility to support activity-based funding. So what, what were you referring to there? Uh, so, I mean, often clinicians believe our primary responsibility is only to a patient and not to the system and not to fund the system. And yet I look at it as an opportunity to make sure that my patients get the funding that they need, you know. And so being an outer metropolitan service with massive growth, the more that we can do to support and document what's happening for our patients so that we get the funding that will then support them through the future, that's actually really important to me. And when you're talking about the downside of ABF, one of the things that depressed me when it first came in was the realisation of how little my senior staff in my facility were actually oversighting what the junior doctors were documenting. And they left it completely in their hands and weren't actually making sure that what was documented was accurate um, or that it was the whole picture. Mm. And Craig, I think when we spoke, you mentioned something about that as well, about the problems with the junior doctors. Can you just let the audience know? Yeah, um, identifying, we, we changed some of the terminology locally, and I have to, a bit of a shout out to my medical record people in the room, yay. Mm -hmm. um, that they, um, uh, we, we changed the nomenclature and the terminology with the consent of the senior docs, that we stopped talking about coding errors. We actually now talk about documentation errors. Mm. And why Be did you change that language? Why was that important? Well, uh, for two reasons. One is it's factually not correct, mm -hmm. because when we repeatedly look at it, 70% of the time the documentation and the coding is correct. In the 30% when it's wrong, only 5% of that time is it a pure coding error. 
Twenty percent of the time, it's just that the doctors, usually the juniors, uh, didn't document it. So we, wrote, we, we in, write. in the private sector, it's the senior doctors, I might say. <laughs> and, 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 they're much, and they're much better. <laughs> Uh, but the um, and so we're, we're rather keen on the app. So we've we've already made a little note to to, to, to mm. roll out the the app about uh, the, the documentation. So uh, thinking about that as um, uh, looking at the whole thirty percent, it's actually about the documentation. And the analogy I sometimes use with our senior doctors, it's the coders are like your tax accountant. It's actually still your tax return. It's only as good mm. as the information that you <laughs> give them. Yeah, mm. yeah. they're helping you. Uh, it's not the other way around. So, uh, but be able to take it down, one of the tricks that we did was actually showing the doctors, particularly for the complications, mm. every code for that patient, for every patient mm. that had a complication. And for many of them, it was the first time they'd actually really looked at the, all of the codes. Mm. And we got two responses. One is, actually the data's better than, than everybody says it is, which was heartening. <laughs> so, and the second one is that when it was uh, an issue, and you know, you pull the record out and they say, this person's clearly got diabetes and you say, show me. And then they flick it through and then there's a quick call to the junior saying, oi. That they don't have diabetes. How about you write it down? Yeah. So, some of the, so that had a, a, a change uh, for the better to the extent that, um, uh, and documenting complications as being present on a mission when they clearly were, mm. uh, and other things. We, we took our mm. hospital acquired complications from 3%, which is higher than the national average of two, mm -hmm. down to one. Which is, it's a gr that's a great achievement. And so the quality of the data, the reliability of the data improved. Interestingly, um, when the, it was high, the clinicians blamed the documentation. When it was low, they said, no, it was all them. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I love yeah, that idea too of you um, not blaming the coders because one of the, we, we started collecting hospital acquired complications at HealthScope, not for funding, but for, just for quality purposes. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, the poor coders and the poor health information managers, and I know you're, you, you understand this, you, you get blamed for if, if we don't get enough funding from coding, and now, well, let's blame you for not the, the quality not being right as well. <laughs> so you get you're the meat in the sandwich here, and it's, you've got to be really careful of the burnout of just putting all that pressure onto our mm. coders and our health information mm. managers who, who do feel the pressure, even though it's not, it's the documentation, it's not the, not the coding. So you and I might just, might just go to you, because we're just, we're talking now about particularly about quality and safety. What are the, the key um, examples where ABF has really improved um, quality and safety in healthcare that you've noticed? <laughs> there aren't many um, standout examples of where ABF has improved quality and safety. And I think you know the, the journey that we're now on as a nation over the last couple of years around um, hacks or central events or readmissions, whatever, whatever the levers are we're going to use. I, 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 we mustn't lose sight of what the what the aim here. The aim is, um, I guess, what I try would call a triple aim. It's about improving population health, improving mm. care of the individual, and spending less dollars per episode of care that you know, where it's possible. And the challenge for us in a system that's fairly tight for money already is if we start withdrawing money from the system, with the expectation that by withdrawing money we will drive improvement. Um, I, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure there's skilled logic behind it. There are challenges there, and, and, and there's a, there are other ways of doing it. So VMI, the the um, public insurer in Victoria, last year rolled out an incentivisation scheme for maternity services in Victoria, where they gave them a discount on their um, liability fees, their indemnity fees. So for some of our big services, that's about half a million dollars for some of our big maternity mm. services. But you only get it if you invest that discount Back in, in improvements mm -hmm. in your mm -hmm. targeted improvements in your maternity services. Uh, and I think um, Victor we haven't we've activated central event pricing in Victoria. We haven't yet activated hacks. Um, and so I guess the state health department's weighing the costs currently. Um, I, 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 you know, we we need to be careful. I mean, there are mm. lessons from the private sector. I, as Cathy says, the private sector have been doing it longer for that. So although, you know, work that we did with, just, just very quick look at work we did with Medibank a year or so ago suggested that there was a, there is a fall in hacks across the system, about 14, 15%. And that fall is present whether you're pricing or not. And what, what, why was that fall? Why did it happen then if it wasn't to do with pricing? Well, I'm not sure we understand. I mean, uh, there are falls in hacks across the globe. You know, if mm. all systems who now collect measures mm. of, um, 
hostel acquired complications, there is a fall. And, and again, it, some of it relates to the regulation of the system. So in, in the US, um, the lesser regulated services have seen a fall in hacks, but they've seen an increase on present on admission right. complications. So yeah. suddenly, mm. catheter related UTIs have gone up on admission yeah. in <laughs> patients who didn't have catheters. I mean, uh, you know, so, you know, one has to be careful in how one mm. records that. Do you think it's the Hawthorne effect, Ewan? Mm. Uh, <laughs> we talked about that a bit earlier. Well, it might be. Um, Look, you know, as the as Victoria's um, Safety Quality Improvement Agency, I, I'm loving that we've got a focus on hacks. Mm. Just not completely convinced that withdrawing money from services mm. is, is sufficient to drive improvement. And you know, one of the one of the real dangers, and Kathy's alluded to it already. You know, you know, health government not not measuring hacks for funding, mm. measuring hacks for genuine improvement. But one of the one of the challenges and one of the risks for us is a system that's built on hacks. I mean, we're built, we, we've, we've been rewarding hacks up until now. <laughs> and as you withdraw that. that from the system, we'll just stop coding. So we'll, mm. we'll undercode now. So we will see a fall in hacks. Are our patients safer and better because of it? Not sure. So in other words, you, you don't want to just have people playing the system if, if that's the situation. Yeah, and, and I think I mean, playing the system's one way of putting it. I mean, there's, not, there's no malevolence here. Mm. Um, we've got very smart people um, at all levels of our system trying to do the best possible for their service, for their patients, for the system more broadly. So this isn't game playing for the sake of trying to you know, pull one over the department I like to think that's the case um but we just need to be careful of, of what 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 might be the perverse outcomes from some of these levers as we pull them amanda do you have some um from my point of view we're not there yet but the mm -hmm. best opportunity that the hacks and this body of work provides is actually getting data back to the clinicians because mm -hmm. otherwise we all think we're doing reasonably well mm -hmm. most of the time and it's only when you're confronted with good hard data that demonstrates that you're doing really well in this space, but actually here's an opportunity to do something. Um, and so the better we get at feedback loops where clinicians get information about their performance, you know, and we'll have a grief response when we get it and we'll deny it and we'll be a bit pissed off and say the data's wrong yeah. and that kind of thing. And then we'll bargain and try and include and exclude things. But eventually, if you get to a space of acceptance, okay, I've got a problem with this. What can I do about it? That's when we're really cooking the gas. Do you think that data, I was interested in um, Andrew Street's presentation where he showed in the, in the UK the access that patients can have to really transparent data about clinicians and their outcomes. And do you think that sort of system would ever be introduced in Australia? And if it was, what difference would it make? Uh, I think it will. Um, it will, will. Will we have clinician, individual clinician outcomes? For sure we will. Mm. I mean, many of our colleges, probably including my own college, certainly the College of Surgeons, would deny it today. Um, well, they're living in cloud cuckoo land. Mm. Of course we'll have um, clinician, individual clinician re um, reported outcomes. Um, I'm not sure, I mean, I, I missed Andrew's presentation and I um, was talking to James about it, but I, I'm, well, the, the jury's still out whether patients use that, mm. Um, but clinicians use it, mm. yeah. so it, I would hate to think, you know, well, in that terms of who they refer to, or like refer patients on to, or no, well, well, both that, but also yeah. I don't like to think that, you know, Amanda's a better clinician than I am. So if, if oh, her okay. outcomes look better than mine, <laughs> and I'm in palliative care, if, if, <laughs> her, if, her, you know, if her outcomes look better than mine, we're, and we were in the same craft group, which yeah. we're not, we're at polar ends. But um, then I, that, I think so. There is evidence that clinicians change their practice, mm, exactly. and, and that mortality reduces. Yes. yes. Yeah. So we've got wonderful study that came out a couple of years ago now from the UK that just shows uh, was it colorectal surgery, and and the the mortality rate drops as soon as you publicly report individual clinician. Data. Data. It's magic. Um, it's my favourite study of the last two years, you can tell. <laughs> um, yeah, it's certainly naive yeah. to suggest that, you know, that now that this data exists, that it's not going to end up yeah. in the, in, in the uh, public sector you know, so that, we, so that uh, the healthcare consumers can look at it. Uh, and to come back to the point that Ewan was making, I think you know, there, are, there are potential 
perverse or unintended consequences of some of these processes, mm -hmm. uh, and, and particularly some of the hacks. And that's, you know, that's clearly one of the important roles that the IPA plays, and that's clinical mm -hmm. advice, is to, is to monitor those unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. I mean, a good example might be that, uh, that if we look at the, uh, the ongoing role of, uh, of potential readmission uh, yeah. data, you know, that uh, we might, for instance, see problems you know, with prolonged length of stay for patients, particularly with you know, with fragile cardiac problems, yeah. you know, because of the uh, because of the implications of, a, of an early readmission, mm -hmm. you know, where you know, where we may, you know, in an environment where we're under pressure to discharge, 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 yeah. um, that may change practice. Now, it may change practice for the better, but it may change practice for the worse, given that prolonging length of stay of almost anybody mm. is associated mm. with further complications. Craig? I, I look at it, because I completely agree, but I also look at it from the point of view of um, why would you hold, hide your data? Because when you have a Bundaberg, when you have a Mid-Staffordshire, mm. when you have a any disaster that comes out, the data is in the public domain. So wouldn't it be much, much better to get it out while you're controlling and looking at it in a civilised way, yeah. rather than waiting until the disaster happens. So that's point number one. Point number two is whilst I'm very, uh, I've been very enthusiastic about having hacks being so visible mm -hmm. and looking at that, there has been a slight counterpoint, and that is that the remainder of the complications have been defocused. Um, there, all of the stuff coming out of uh, Mid Staffordshire, the King's Fund, uh, the stuff that Duckett writes about, all of that says you must look at all of your complications. So you need the big picture, not just focusing Absolutely. on one. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, the wonderful thing that Hacks did was it got the finance department and the reporting people very interested in this. But I actually had a hard job getting them to say, yes, but can you give me all the others as well? Everything oh, no, else. we're only interested in Hacks. Yeah. So it's actually time now, I think, to move to that. Model. all complications because um, and, 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 and it's easy to be depressed about that because whilst the rate hasn't gone down mm. the volume of patients go going through our facilities has gone up in my lifetime length of stay has gone from 10 days to two days mm. uh, the complexity and the number of comorbidities of patients has gone up enormously yeah. and the coding staff are assiduously looking for every possible com uh, complication mm. so in that environment for the complication rate to remain yeah. steady is a marvelous achievement mm. That's a very good point. Ewan, did you have yeah, an Amanda? Mean, I, I, yeah, I agree with Craig. I, th I, think, um, I think it's due to IPA's credit that, that we have been very cautious in the hacks that we have launched. And you know, as they were being built, I was badgering James to have um, severe perineal trauma as one of the hacks. And um, IPA just couldn't risk adjust it adequately to make it mm. um, saleable to the sector. And, I, and I, think, I think that was right and proper. But what it has done now is got us into a reporting mentality yeah. mm. that, and I agree with Craig, we should report all hacks. Whether we price for them all is another mm. matter, mm. but at least we could report them. Yeah. In terms of individual clinicians, and it, we, are, we, no, we will get there, but there are some serious um, and important um, anxieties. And you know, the, this, the general surgeons would say, well, you know, one of the challenges for us is that our young surgeons uh, are the surgeons who are staffing um, overnight and doing emergency laparotomies mm. and mortality and complication rates are much higher for yeah. emergency procedures than they are for a cold elective surgery and so how do we correct for that because you, d you don't want to um, contaminate a young surgeon's career she starts yeah. out on her career just because she's staffing the mm. on-call emergency laparotomies but you know the, the you know the minds that are in this room and the minds that are elsewhere in the country we can risk adjust those okay. things yeah. and i think we just need to get on this progressive public reporting transparent data mm. road and the sky will not fall in on us amanda yeah and kind of transparent public reporting will change the behavior of some people but to follow up on Craig's comment about inquiries, I, the reason I'm interested in safety and quality was because three months into my first staff specialist job at Camden Hospital, you may well be familiar with Camden and Campbelltown Hospitals, yep. mm. the proverbial hit the fan. And what amazed me through living through all of that was how many people did not drive past our hospitals to go further up the road. Mm. They came because they were sick and desperately ill mm. and they needed help. And so even in the face of public reporting, they still turn there up. will be a lot of people mm. who just need help and they need it locally and they mm. will still turn up. So it will change some people's behaviour, but the sickest and the most vulnerable will mm. still be there. Yep. 
Sophie, did you have anything to add before we move on? I, I think I just wanted to just mention that um, when you look at a reduction in hacks, so Craig was talking about a reduction, we've had a reduction at HealthScope as well over two years, is it just data? Is it just better quality data? And in the end, it doesn't really matter. Now we know, cause, because if you get rid of all that noise of incorrect data and incorrect clinical documentation causing errors in coding or whatever the case may be, you can actually pinpoint the real issues because you can find the hacks that actually are preventable if you get rid of all of the other stuff. And so even if we are just getting rid of all of the data issues at the moment, even that is so thing. valuable. Yeah. It's incredibly valuable. Even that's a good thing. Yeah, um, we've, we might move on to some questions from the app. We've had heaps of questions flying in, so that's really good. Um, so the first question is from Natalie Bryant, and she asks, we often hear that ABF incentives uh, incentives in patient care, does funding truly influence a clinician's decision where to treat a patient? So who'd like to have a stab at that one? Uh, yes, but not often, of, sometimes not of their own making. So uh, oncology is a classic case in point, massive administrative change, mm. uh, must be outpatient, must be inpatient, then back to outpatient, it depends on the flavour of the month, are we after uh, CMBS revenue or are we after WOW? Mm. Um, so that changes that setting. I don't know that it changes the clinical care at all. It changed a tick in a box on a computer in that particular example. There are other examples where I think it has, and I'm sure the others have got mm. examples. I, I, I sort of, I, I think I agree with what you're saying, but I, I disagree in that I don't think it, it impacts cl the decisions clinicians no. make. I think what you find is that these are institutional decisions yep. uh, based on you know, based on a, an institutional approach to things like, you know, like uh, oncology, like dialysis, mm. you know, these sort of things that can be you know, inpatient or outpatient delivered care, mm. um, and you know, and then depending on uh, other factors, you know, there are a whole stream of other things that can potentially be uh, things. So I don't think I, I think clinicians make decisions not on financial basis. Yeah. I think you've only got to look at the expensive treatments that you know, <laughs> clinicians are happy to. Uh, you know, to offer mm. you know, to know that the, the dollars aren't driving those decisions. So Ewan, did you have some well, thoughts? I mean, what it does do, and it goes back to some of the comments that Christine talked about in her reform slides, is it gets in the way of preventative measures. And one yeah. of the things that programs like Health Links and others, um, it, it allows opportunities to put preventative community based mm. measures in place that will reduce hospitalisation usage. Um, and activity, and it's not it's not activity based funding per se. It's it, it's it's that, but it's also our structural funding divide between Commonwealth and state, mm -hmm. and um, you know, people commentators on f funding reform often cite Canterbury. Canterbury had to, mm -hmm. you know, they were forced to make fundamental reform. Um, we have two pairs here, um, and you know the attraction of some of the reforms that Christine talked about and. And the, you know, the, the examples that health links and other systems mm. give us is actually it's about breaking down the structural barriers mm. to funding that are getting in the way of place of care. Anyone else want to comment on that before we move on? We've got quite a few questions, so I want to get through as many as I can. We might just talk for a minute about um, value-based funding. And, and one of the questions we wanted to cover was, how do we make the future directions of value-based funding a reality for clinicians? Would like to, Al Alistair? Oh, I mean, I think, yeah, I, I think, value-based funding is already something that is changing models of care uh, uniformly, not just in Australia but uh, but overseas. And I give you a personal example, um, you know, and it's not, it won't be unfamiliar to almost everybody in the room. But you know, you know I've got a son who's a physio, and he uh, he worked in the NHS for a number of years. Um, and uh, where he, in a musculoskeletal uh, outpatient environment, was the gatekeeper for MRI, was the gatekeeper for referral to orthopaedics. So you had to go through a physio with your musculoskeletal problem before you could get those sort of investigations performed. And he's come back to our jurisdiction and is running a similar program. But I know those sort of you know, but hasn't got the levers to be the gatekeeper for referral. Mm. So Ewan, did you have any thoughts about that, about how do we make the future directions of, of value-based funding a reality for clinicians? Um, I mean, I think it, it, it is about co-design, isn't it? It's about having patients and clinicians involved in the planning of changing how we do in mm. the physio gatekeeper example for um, orthopaedics, musculoskeletal is the, is, you know, is the sort of archetypal example of 
changing. If, if, if the entry point to the system is you see an orthopaedic surgeon, well, we train our orthopaedic surgeons to do operations. You will have an operation. Yeah. Um, the commission you know, publishes if, um, atlases of variation. Yeah. They're a gold mine of saying, here's where we should go for mm -hmm. value-based healthcare initiatives. In my own discipline, uh, we have a seven-fold variation across the state of Victoria in hysterectomy rates. Yeah. Um, why is that? Well, because it's, if you get sent to a gynecologist, you, we train a gynecologist to do hysterectomies. That's she will take do. your uterus yeah. out. Yeah? Yeah. So it's about changing, but don't impose a change system mm. on our workforce mm. or on our consumers. Involve them in the design mm. of the change. I think it's the same as we've been saying earlier. It's the transparency. Uh, no clinician that I know wants to be the outlier. Yeah. Mm. Exactly. Um, we'll, we'll just go to a question for the from, for the app, which sort of follows on to transparency. James Downey is asking, uh, he'd be interested in, in Ewan's view of the value of benchmarking things like hack rates. And we talked about making you know, individual yeah. doctors' um, uh, rates public, but should there be public reporting of, of um, health-associated um, complications, hospital-associated complications? Oh, well, I think, I think there should. Um, I'm, I'm anxious a wee bit about... Um, benchmarking per se in mm -hmm. the first instance uh, and we and why must is that? why is that yeah well because um i mean our our the, the industry is very complex and our, the it, it would depend on how we were able to risk adjust and again mm -hmm. um i agree with craig's point you know while we've well if i have um confidence and we have confidence in the risk adjustment of the hacks that we're pricing for and mm -hmm. um, let's not limit our public reporting just to those hacks mm -hmm. and so if we can't risk adjust for the others quite as confidently as we have for the list that we're pricing for we just need to take that into account do we want a do we want a my schools equivalent for our hospitals mm -hmm. maybe we do um i just don't think the system has the confidence yet to do that? Will we get to a place where we're benchmarking either formally, f formally um, probably? Um, in the first instance, it will be informal. It will be my hospital looking up the road, at the, you know, to the hospital up the road saying, well, they look a bit better for, for these disciplines and a bit worse, and why is that? But if we could get our hospitals talking to each other, what, yeah. are you, what have you done to mm. reduce that mm. hack? So they can learn from others' yeah. experience. Yeah. Not so, um, so public reporting, absolutely. I mean, our view at Safer Care Victoria is mm. we should all, these data belong to our citizens mm. and they should be going back into the hands of our citizens. So Amanda? Um, and I think one of the challenges with some of the hacks is that some of them, for example, delirium or perineal tears, if you're providing an excellent model of care where you're screening for the presence of delirium, um, repeatedly mm. during an admission, you are much more likely to find it. And so potentially the centres of excellence with fantastic care will have a higher rate and look worse, and actually it's because they're mm. better. In the same way with perineal tears, if you just eyeball, you may not find every perineal tear, but if you examine, you may. And so the centres that are providing good care mm. may actually so perversely questions and looking for things, I'll find um, them. look worse. Yeah. Um, just, uh, does anyone in the audience have questions? If you do, please raise your hand and we'll try to get a microphone around to you. So anyone in the audience like to ask a question? Otherwise, I'll just keep going. Yeah, we've got one up the back. While we get there, I'll just ask, um, I'll ask another question from the app. So Wendy Sir asks, do the clinicians have an opinion on the view that we are not yet publicly reporting on quality clinical outcomes because the financial agenda has been overshadowing the quality and safety agenda? Should safety inform the funding? So who'd like to have a go at that? Safety should always inform the funding, and as Ewan says, the question is how. How? So the principle is a no-brainer, but it's the challenge of how do you do it without completely scaring everybody on the first round. Um, I often wonder about these things and say, well, what we should do is collect everybody's complications for publishing in two years' time, but if you make an improvement, we won't publish the bad stuff. So there's a time frame for public. So put it in a time capsule and say, yeah. let's look at it in But if you've time. made the improvement because your data wasn't good or mm. whatever the excuse was, or we got better normalisation, yeah. then we won't publish the bad historical stuff. But you've got to, whether it's two years or five, it actually probably doesn't matter. But you've got to start somewhere. Yeah. Amanda, and then we'll, we've got to, we'll go to a question from the floor in a minute. And I still think the first step is getting that data back to clinicians yes. first. Yeah. I'd prefer to learn about it myself than read it in the paper. 
yeah. um, and then have to address it. So, <laughs> or on the seven thirty or something. Yeah. Um, uh, no, so I've got any sure stories for seven thirty though. Get in touch. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not be nice. sure. I completely agree with Kate because, and I, I mean, I, I share the anxiety and I feel the anxiety you know, as a clinician, but 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 then we're hiding from the fundamental driver to improvement, um, and um, this is what. And I know, I know it's a tiresome comparison, but this is what aviation learned a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And it's nothing to do with that they're just flying metal tubes. It's a culture. Mm -hmm. They've solved the culture piece, yep. and we haven't solved that. Mm -hmm. And that will be the solution to better mm -hmm. safety. And so what, uh, what are those steps to change that culture? I mean, it's a big question, but... Just make everything transparent. Mm -hmm. And, and but but not have a punitive mm. yeah. response so not, not to fixed. so when yep. harm happens, you don't sack the nurse or yep. sack the physio or sack the surgeon or yep. whatever. It's understanding why did the harm happen. It's very rarely an individual. Mm. It's usually the system, and even more rarely is there malevolence, intended harm. That that is, mm. you know, exceptionally uncommon, um, and yet. Our whole behaviours are built around, and n n not not uniquely medical behaviours, but the most evident in medical behaviours. Our whole behaviours are around: you made a mistake, you have mm -hmm. to answer for that. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't begin to improve if that's the starting the point. The attitude. Yeah. yeah. Alistair, I think we, and we'll go to our question yeah, in the audience. I think we also need to recognise to go to the, the question a bit that uh, it wasn't until funding came part of this process that the investment in getting the quality data mm -hmm. yep. you know, and the you know, and the recognition of the yeah. of the manpower yeah. that was required to yeah. do that and mm -hmm. you know, suddenly you know, having good coders was the, the most important yeah. thing a hospital could do. Um, you know, it, that's what drove this. You know, okay. Once the data's there, I don't think there's any doubt that that the safety agenda will over mm -hmm. will change culture. So what Alistair is yeah. saying, I think, and I agree with you, it was a necessary evil mm -hmm. to yeah. get through that it was the the the, the catalyst mm. yeah. mm -hmm. to get us over. But now that we've matured, uh, now's the time to continue on to to, yeah. to broaden and embed that. the culture. Yeah, we might just go to our question from the audience. If you could just stand up and identify uh -huh. where you're from as well. Ragar from Swanil District Health. Um, it's a common question, even though it's uh, on Safer Care Victoria as well. Um, when a health service has made a recommendation to improve um, resources for patient safety reasons, this particular funding model doesn't cater for those resource requirement. Um, I would like to get comments from uh, the panel, including uh, Professor Ian Wallace. <laughs> Thank you. You first. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I mean, we were just chatting at lunch, Amanda, I was just chatting at lunch actually about, Amanda was asking me what, what's been the most surprising thing in being involved in safer care. So, mm. you know, those of you who are visiting us from interstate, we're just two, two years old, uh, safety agency, two years old, um, in response to um, Stephen Duckett's review of our public hospital governance um, system. Um, the most surprising thing for me, uh, one of the most surprising things for me is um, great pleasure and privilege to visit our hospitals and our health services and then find you know, whether they're from RCAs or system reviews, find recommendations that in some cases are years old and the board doesn't have visibility. So in Victoria, we have 84 health services, 84 boards. The, the board and the board chair is ultimately responsible for those recommendations. And the lack of line of sight at the, you know, the, you know at the, the board level about recommendations and again it goes back to culture you know mm. recommendations are made by an RCA you know review committee and um, maybe they're a bit hidden from the coup or from the CEO because you know they've got funding input you know and they've hidden again you know it's a culture thing mm. and so what struck me is not that there's not money to make the recommendation but rather the hospital itself often as an institution hasn't invested in the process and the rec it doesn't feel it own the recommendation lives in the quality office mm. down the corridor they've made the recommendation doesn't belong to us mm. does, that, does that answer your doesn't really answer your question at all yeah i'm interested in the views of the others yeah and who else would like to comment on that issue about about 
culture being an issue and the quality, staying with the quality office and not pervading through the whole um, culture of an organisation or a hospital? Mm. Oh, absolutely. So we collect tax in my organisation because the board puts a massive priority on this. And I think that you can, you can incentivise, you know, complications all you like with money, but unless your CEO and your board are talking about complications and patient outcomes and... Mm then the data, the quality data will remain with some poor bugger who has to <laughs> deal with it because there isn't anyone senior enough to really drive it throughout the organisation. So it's start with why. Why mm. are we collecting this? Why do we want to know? Why mm. is this important? And then everything else follows from that purpose, basically. And so having that, that top-down approach that you just um, explained, what difference has that made in your organisation to, to hack rates, do you think? Having the board really engage with that as an issue? It's, uh, it is the major factor. So we don't, we don't have any financial penalties in our organisation for hacks. You don't need financial penalties to, to make an impact on this. Um, it does help if you have a, a board or CEO that isn't so interested. It does help and I think it's really positive to have a financial penalty or bonus attached, mm -hmm. but you don't need it. So everyone is driven by the same purpose to, to reduce complications, to improve safety, to improve quality. And if you have your leaders talking about it, it, is, it makes a massive difference. It is everything, actually. And is that re reflected in your experience, um, Amanda and Alistair, in the public system? I mean, I think in, in my experience, you know, the ownership of, uh, of recommendations, you know, if they're cost neutral, is taken on by the, uh, mm -hmm. is taken on mm -hmm. by the, the departments that have, uh, that have been involved. But once they become co anything but cost neutral, um, even though in the long term any you know, any intervention of this nature is actually going to be mm. you know, is is actually going to be positive in your you know, in your bottom line. Um, you know, in the public sector and certainly in the jurisdiction that I work in, um, there is a you know, there's a clear distraction that the political agenda overrides sometimes you know, the agenda of the organisation administration. Mm. Amanda, do you have some thoughts? Um, or? Just Ewan was mentioning governance, and I think one of the challenges still in Australia today is that corporate governance often trumps clinical governance. Mm. And actually, clinical governance, a shared responsibility to provide the best patient care, should actually drive everything, including our corporate governance. Mm. And how do you embed that? How do you embed that as a principle to. That's really challenging. Mm. <laughs> I think Ewan? so. Um, Again, the Victorians in the audience will be familiar. So Safer Care, we, last year we um, signed a four-year partnership with the Institute of Healthcare Improvement in mm -hmm. Boston, so IHI. And um, last November, December, they, they published a white paper on clinical governance. And um, I was a bit annoyed because we had published ours the year before, and if I knew theirs was coming, we would have held <laughs> ours. But no, um, yours is better, Ewan. Because, because, because they flipped theirs to have the patient. So instead of talking mm. about safety, um, they talk about keep me safe. Yeah. You know? And I, so I think actually, um, and you know, the, as, as we've talked with boards um, through our board governance, our clinical governance training, everyone gets it. Mm. Um, but it needs said. Yeah? Yeah. So I, I don't think it's a difficult journey. Um, but it is about, actually, you own this. Mm. And, you know, and again, you know, there is a possibility that our insurers won't indemnify you if there is a clear governance failure, and that's sometimes missed. Yeah, um, but no, no one argues with it. Um, so I quite like the IHI's flipping and putting mm. the patient, the consumer, right in the middle. Yeah. yeah. Now we've got a couple of minutes left. If you do have a question, just please raise your hand, and we'll run a microphone over. Do we have any other? We've got a follow-up question there? Any other questions? <laughs> We've got a question here, so we'll just run the microphone to this gentleman here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, really enjoying this discussion. So um, uh, we've had a, a, a fairly close focus on uh, safety and some of the issues around how we address that. I, I wonder if the panel could reflect on how um, outcomes, the broader set of outcomes and value for patients could be brought into the funding framework. I'd be interested in your ideas about how that might happen. Okay, who would like to have a, Craig? Yeah, I th <coughs> the, the first thing is to measure it and to have it mm -hmm. available. The, uh, I would love to have the conversations with our clinicians who would equally love to have that, 
but we just don't collect the data. So if you don't collect it, it's not going to happen. I mean, we should just kind of make a decision. We're going to do it, and that's be just that. Make it routine. Make it routine. Yeah. yeah. Not a not a question of a sample population. Everyone, every time. And it has to be very simple. It's got to be like the Uber app, you know, the star rating when you get out of the cab. It's got to be that simple um, because you don't know when you're doing your analysis how small the sample size is going to become that you then want to have that data. So it should just be routine. I, mean, I think it's a no-brainer. And Amanda, we are starting to do that in New South Wales, aren't we, to do more of that? Yeah, yeah. So there's been a lot more work in patient reported outcome yep. measures in that space and some of it at the national level as well. Yeah. starting to build that up but again there's a way to go yeah but and how how easy would it be to make it like what craig says just make it routine again is it that culture shift that you just make it something that everyone does oh just somebody yeah. needs to say yeah. you don't get any funny if you don't put it in your data set mm. yeah no, then, we'll, then we'll end up with 20 different methods of measuring yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, but it's got to be the one it. That's yeah. exactly, that's what I'm saying. So it's got to be the so decision about So having a simple like an is. Uber app or like a you know, rating yeah. system really to keep it as simple as possible. Ewan, what do you think? Yeah, it, it's the next wave, isn't it? It's the next yeah. change. And again, I, I'm sorry I missed Andrew's um, talk earlier today. I, it, it has to be the next thing. Mm -hmm. We um, And I agree with Craig. It should be just part of the part of the administrative data set should mm. be how does the consumer rate the outcome? Did it, what matters to the person? Mm -hmm. And was that a good outcome for you or not? And I agree, we have to collect the data first um, and then report it and then work out as we do that, how, how do we influence funding for mm. the care that we provide? Because we've lost, and I can't remember, it might have been Christine, we've lost care from healthcare. Mm. Yeah? Mm. And so that's how you bring it back. I would like, sorry, no, go I, uh, one of my passions is, um, as a medical administrator, I get, to, I get to read, I read the history of every person who dies um, to determine whether, you know, whether there's been an issue and things. And I, it, it drives me to despair when I read the chart and the chart says, all cares given, with an S on the end. And I want to ban the S on the end of the word cares. Because I don't want my patient to get cares I want my patients to get care. Yeah. And we've stopped that. And this is why I think it's really important that we actually ask people, were you cared for? Excellent. And I think that would really inform the discussion going forward to, to put the patient at the centre of everything, yeah. everything that we do. So look, we've run out of time, unfortunately. So please give a big round of applause to our panellists.